Okay, so hear me out. I bought a 3D printer for a hobby project, and it just sort of spiraled out of control from there. Now I'm building a brushless DC motor from scratch. Before we go any further, don't do this. Without appropriate education and equipment, this is dangerous. Also, it's not cost effective at all. Seriously, I did this to learn something. For example, 3D printed bearings are just a bad idea unless you really need a non-metallic material for your bearings. I wanted something waterproof, but for entirely foreshadowing reasons, it didn't end up mattering so much. Also, don't wind your own coils. I tried making tools to help, and I'm sure they were helpful, but my fingers took a serious toll. Turns out 18-gauge wire can be feisty. And we need 12 of these coils, so uh, I guessed heavily in the measurement of the connecting wiring, and I guess that's more foreshadowing. <laughs> okay, so that's a fail. I accidentally put them in parallel. So if you look closely, this is the inner one, comes off the center of the spool, and the outer one there, but the outer one is supposed to go to the inner one, <laughs> so I have to cut that off. Yay! Yeah, that's more like it. As I peel away the artifacts of my mistakes, I give thanks to my future mistakes for their unexpected wisdom. Speaking of wisdom, maybe you can learn from my example and never try this yourself. Seriously, it's a waste of time. Get a proper heat gun and save yourself the annoyance. Once we have all three coils assembled, we're ready to start putting it all together. It's just a quick snap. Okay, that was a little too fast. Maybe, uh... Yeah, that's more like it. But we'll show you the time lapse anyway. This way I can tell you about the design of this motor in some more detail. Three coils each with four windings in series make up a Y configuration. What makes this motor extra weird is the orientation of the magnetic poles. The magnetic field is axial instead of the more common radial style. All three coils share a common ground, which is shielded from the environment with a bit of shrink tubing to protect the exposed end. Okay, now we have our stator assembly. We need to add connectors and try a test drive. For the stator coils, I use connectors rated for high current. The coils themselves are enameled, so we only need to worry about waterproofing the connectors. And this couldn't possibly go wrong later. If you watch closely, you can see the precise moment where I failed to account for the lengths of wire in the wiring harness. There I go, lopping off sections of wire because they looked good enough. I would later come to regret not measuring these lengths more precisely. This motor controller I bought from Amazon seemed to be a decent candidate for a good price, so I thought maybe it would just work on the first try. <laughs> you can imagine my surprise when it did not. It did nothing. Okay, I wouldn't call it nothing exactly. It's more like the robot equivalent of a seizure. If I spin the rotor at just the right speed, it does fall into a stable-ish motion. But after running it for a short time, I thought it might look interesting in thermal. So I set up the infrared camera. Shocking absolutely no one, the coils are rather warm despite doing very little work. They're not hot enough to be alarming yet, but definitely not cold. So I started by investing in one of those amazing magnetic field visualization films. These things are truly incredible and invaluable when working with magnets. You can't see the direction of the field, but the flux density is easy to see. Using this on our rotor shows we have a nice clean regular pattern with nothing weird going on. 
To make sure there was nothing weird going on, I tried visualizing something weird going on. <laughs> it blew my mind, but that's a story for another day. No, what we need here is a sensor to measure the local flux and help identify the position of the rotor relative to the stator. We need a hall sensor. These little beauties report a voltage proportional to the intensity of the magnetic field in their proximity. As long as we provide a bit of current to power the sensor, we get a clean analog signal. I don't always do this testing in the kitchen, but sometimes I have to. <laughs> Mount one of these sensors on each of the three coils and we have full closed loop control of our motor, at least in theory. I plugged all the sensors into an Arduino and gave the rotor a spin. And sure enough, we see a happy sinusoid with three phases. This gives me confidence in the wiring, so I move on to the final connector assembly. Again, don't do this. I have the rare gift of patience for tedious manual soldering. As you can see, this involves some precise work. I didn't take the time to file my iron to a sharper point, so maybe you could say I like hard mode. It really would have made things easier. In the end, the connector came together without shorts between any of the pins as long as you keep it dry. It's worth noting, I've been foreshadowing something treacherous when in reality I didn't destroy the motor because of running it in the water. I didn't destroy it at all, yet. That'll be fun for a future video. I just want to highlight how these aspects of the build contributed to an end result, which deviates significantly from its original purpose. So yeah, I failed to deliver a waterproof, high-torque, precision motor, but I also didn't aim for this. It was more of a nice to have. I aimed to test the boundaries of my own understanding of motors and 3D printers and, incidentally, bearings. Thanks for joining me on this journey in mechatronics. My goal with this channel is to share my passion for failure as a tool <laughs> for progressive change. Always remember, when mistakes are welcome, growth is guaranteed.